My name is Phil Schaap. The Sun Ra Festival has been on the air for a little over seven and a half hours. Uh, it will be on the air for 108 hours, 21 minutes, and 51 seconds more. It's going till Tuesday morning, and uh, we're very pleased to, at this juncture, be uh, ushering in the first of our guests, uh, the first interview segment of the Sun Ra Festival. And uh, there are very few, I guess, who could take us back to uh, Saturn in the earliest centuries or Birmingham, Alabama in the earlier proportions of this century. But if the history of the man, the music, the sounds, and the being that it is could be represented in one voice, it would be the early anchor of the reeds and a man who has consistently uh, played well on many instruments, the gentleman who we're going to be talking with now on the Sun Ra Festival, and that is Pat Patrick. Pat, you know, I've got to start off uh, with a compliment, uh, uh, and it's to you. Uh, Thirteen years ago, not to the, you asked me to the day, you know, you're looking at me like, oh, it's got to be to the day now. <laughs> Must be, if you remember it. <laughs> well, but it was uh, during the Ellington Festival of April of 1974 that uh, Pat Patrick reflected that there would be a time, there'd be this moment uh, when uh, the same thing would be done for Sun Ra. And he said, I plan to not be listening, not only listening, I plan to be there. And uh, the 13 years have, uh, have gone rather quickly. And Pat Patrick has appeared on this station and, of course, has maintained his, his remarkable presence in the jazz world. Uh, I know that uh, our last few get-togethers included uh, you playing some bass for Earl Warren and the Countsman. The Basie <laughs> Alumni Band, uh, of course, uh, your incredible presentation during the Thelonious Monk Festival, which was in March of 1976. And in fact, during that uh, Monk Festival, you came forward with your own information, clippings and things. And you, you, you are, right off the bat, you've got some discographical details that uh, you'd like to add to the record have you been listening all afternoon long. Uh, you, uh, of today's yeah, proceedings? Yeah, today's proceedings. Yeah, earlier... Uh... First of all, um, let me thank you for having me up and uh, being a part of this festival for Sun Ra and his music. Um, <clears throat> I was listening earlier on, and uh, they were playing a selection of tunes, and they played some early recordings that we did in Chicago that featured a vocalist. You know, I believe the girl was her name was Hattie Randall. Randolph. She sang a tune called. Uh, Darn that dream! Darn it! No, mile, fl mile flame. I think. Mile flame. Was it? Was either mile flame? No, don't blame me. I think that's <laughs> the one. <laughs> we got finally got. Anyways, uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, um, you had a record. We talked about it once up here of a um, Louis Armstrong playing Zilner Randolph arrangements. Mm -hmm. Well, that young lady is one of his daughters, oh. and. Uh, uh, not only <clears throat> she was in the group at the time, but her brother, Lucius Randolph, played trumpet with the group and may be on that same record, you know. So I just wanted to add that to your archives because uh, his father, their father, Zilner Randolph, uh, re uh, arranged for Louis Ben back in the early Chicago days when he was there. And you have a record that, uh, you know, right. has come out. Well, Zilna Randolph, of course, was the musical director of the early uh, Louis Armstrong orchestras when he went to big band jazz, when mm -hmm. Louis uh, added mm -hmm. in to the ensemble, the one that started in Chicago in 31, and after Louis came back from Europe. Uh, Zilna T. Randolph, we might also point out to our listeners, is uh, very, very much uh, active. He is 88 years of age. Uh, his focus now is uh, to... Uh, He's really thinking in terms of writing a jazz musical mm -hmm. or a jazz, blues, and gospel musical. Mm -hmm. And he's incorporating different themes that he's sketched out over the years. And who knows, maybe his daughter would be a vocalist <laughs> in that musical. Be nice to hear him play his trumpet again, too, because he was pretty mean back there. You know, he played second cherry to, to Louis. And when, I, when that record first came out a few years back, I picked up a couple of copies, and I had the pleasure of delivering it to him personally in Chicago, and he was really thrilled to see it, you know, so it was nice. Well, I'm very thrilled to see Pat Patrick. This is a live interview on our Sun Ra Festival on WKCR-FM New York. Phil Schaap with you, with me, Pat Patrick, with us, the 
music of Sun Ra. And uh, although we've uh, we've talked this uh, these things uh, over on these airways before, this is a whole new scene, a whole new happening on our on our listening experiences. This is the prediction you made for the Sun Ra Festival. You made it uh, during the Duke Ellington Festival in April of uh, of nineteen. 19- 74. Why don't we start with a general uh, question, a general concept. Uh, Ellington, of course, is a major known composer and a lifelong band leader who had many key sidemen uh, stay with him for remarkably long periods of time. Uh, and clearly, uh, you're, you are one of them, although you, you've gone here, there, and everywhere, but you've always been in the, in the spheres of Sun Ra. John Gilmore is another. And, of course, we can make our parallels, you know, to the Johnny Hodgeses and the Harry Carneys, right. just in the Reed section alone. But uh, on all levels, if you could make a comparison, your perceptions of Ellington, and I know you subbed in the Ellington band. Uh, with, briefly. Briefly with Harry Carney, with uh, R- Russell Proko. Russell Proko, yes. Yeah. And, uh, but if you could, uh, in general... Um, relate the two as major composer, lifelong band leaders in the history of jazz? Well, um, I think the world is a much better place uh, due to their their presence here and their, their work here. Um, I shudder to think <laughs> sometimes what this world would be like without... Uh, artists of that stature, you know, coming along and uh, giving us uh, these these glimpses of beauty, you know, and uh, something to uh, inspire us and uh, sink our teeth in and, you know, it make, makes for a better place to live, you know. Uh, I think I've been pretty fortunate to be, to have had some association with the two gentlemen of which you speak, Sun Ra and Duke Ellington. And I have to throw in a third there, too, a Thelonious Monk. Mm. Uh, I, I feel quite privileged, if I never hit another note, to have been around uh, those gentlemen. And, uh, you know, what can I say? It's just been quite re- rewarding, you know. Well, let's throw that since you brought in Monk. Let's uh, let's uh, throw that in. A monk is a very important and thorough, and he's a genius as a composer. His key compositions are tunes, short little vignettes of sound that illustrate a theme, a development, and 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 wrap themselves up uh, in uh, all sorts of harmony, rhythm, and then wind up. Duke, who wrote those kind of tunes, writes tone parallels, to use his frame, uh, his word. Uh, we could call them symphonies. We certainly can call them extended composition. Uh, how does, uh, what categories do Sun Ra's compositions are? Could you name one and, and say what it is? Could you discard, just take one or, or twice? Well, they played, they played one earlier today um, uh, that went through a short series of variations that had sort of a, a, uh, Well, it gave the premise of uh, uh, like a synopsis of a longer, what would be a longer work in that it went through various tempo changes, key changes. Um, uh, Geez, I can't I can't put my finger on the title of it, but I heard it just earlier today on some of the earlier uh, recordings that they were playing as a potpourri of stuff to start to show. Mm -hmm. But. uh, Sun Ra certainly has uh, is prolific in his writing. You know, he's written long, short, medium. I mean, you name it. He's he's uh, he's covered a lot of territory in his writing, and not only of writing music. The man is a uh, uh, the the person Sun Ra is a uh, is a very profound in, in literary type writing. You know, I mean, he's got a lot of thoughts. A lot of things to say, and he has said them in uh, on many occasions, you know, and put them down. And he has enough material for books. Past in Chicago, man, he used to, he was writing music and prose, so to speak, uh, 
so often that that, that uh, you couldn't hardly keep up with it. You know? mm -hmm. We're talking with Pat Patrick, who has over a 35-year musical rapport with <coughs> music and man and person and orchestra of Sun Ra. And uh, I'm Phil Schaap. I'm here trying to pry out little things from 35 <laughs> years ago and from 35 minutes ago. And I'm going to lean on my man, Pat Patrick, a little bit more. Here, Here is something that you've read the music. You've looked at the book from the get-go. Uh, does Sun Ra use any kind of... Uh, does he use any uh, personalized musical notation as opposed to the standard score kind of things? Are there Are there symbols that he uses that indicate these tempo shifts uh these lips leaps of uh, mood and flavorings in his work uh, or, or is it a standard score parallel to the things you've seen well, elsewhere if it if if there is uh i guess it it happens in such a subtle way that you don't realize it because see he he was one always person to rehearse a lot you know and so during the course of rehearsing uh whatever whatever he, he wanted to be said or expressed in the music uh, through conversation and rehearsing and whatnot, you ultimately got the idea and it came together, you know. Uh, whether or not there were special notations, I'm sure there was. How I about now? You're still looking at the music now. Well, I mean, uh, I... I can't say that there's any like you know like a <laughs> somebody has a peculiar symbol or something that mm -hmm. they throw down on the paper. No, I don't. I don't. It's standard then. I don't think there's uh, anything too out of the ordinary there. That because uh, you know his the personnel of his band changes quite a bit over the years, and uh, you've got to have some semblance of a common. Uh, vocabulary there if you expect people to come and sit down and, and read the music so he i think he tends to stay pretty close to what is the norm you know mm -hmm. in the music language you know i'm going to ask you one one more question about a band concept and relating it to sun ra and then we're, we're going to go to this music that you brought us uh from recent vintage and then we'll go back and talk about the old days in the person of john gilmore as the key tenor soloist um Sun Ra has, of course, linked himself with yet another major tradition, and of course, it's part of the big band tradition too, which is the tenor saxophone. Occasionally, two tenor saxophones has been a focus of Sun Ra's music. Um, we may both remember well in the mid '70s where Farrow was uh, an added starter on many incredible engagements. And uh, I mean, if you like the theatrical, which of course Sun Ra is a master of, uh, there was one night over at Storyville. I think before they changed the name of it from Storyville to Storytown, so I really think it was Storyville, <laughs> where he set off the double tenor saxophone action while having Pharaoh come out from what actually was a bathroom, but it's from the rear of the stage. And, of course, uh, John Gilmore was with the orchestra, and he was on stage there. Um, to what extent does Sun Ra interested in having two soloists on the same instrument or two of the same instrument to illustrate something that he wants to put across in the music? Have you ever? Are, are, oh yeah, he he recently had two tenor sax on on the band. Uh, as a matter of fact, the other tenor saxophone player, whose name was Ron Wilson, the three of us was in high school together <laughs> in DeSalvo at the same time, and um, they went out to California back in must have been 85 or so and he was living out there at the time and uh from that point he started playing with the band i guess he must have stayed with the band a year or so you know he's ad hoc still with the band i you know he just recently returned home because we were over in europe a few times and up and down the coast and out in the midwest and back out in california and he was there and it was it was very nice and interesting to have uh two tenors in the band for, for a while because we generally have two and three and four altos and, and have had a couple of baritones over the years mm -hmm. a lot of times. Do you think yeah. it's just the personnel or the, the uh, do you think there's a reason why there has uh, been a dominance of altos and a key reliance on the baritone saxophone in, in that band? I mean, for long, when Sun Ra came up, the, the, uh, the reed section was two altos, two tenors. But I mean, you've seen things like 
three altos, uh, mm. uh, doubling clarinets and flutes and baritone and just the one tenor. Of course, that's John Gilmore's is a featured soloist. Mm. Uh, or do you think there's any uh, a line of musical logic in the instrumentation of the reed section, the section you've been a part of in the Sun Ra Orchestra? As compared to the other stuff, is that what you're saying? Well, is it, is it just a circumstance that has had the various reed formations? Certainly circumstance and personnel and personalities has a lot to do with it. But do you think there's a musical reason for the voicing of the reeds that Sun Ra uses? Well, to get at the bottom of that, you certainly would have to ask Sun Ra. <laughs> but uh, just to look back on, the, you know, what has happened, I think the reason why John Gilmore and Marshall Allen and myself have been fairly consistent in that uh, in that read section, and Charles Davis and 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 uh, Danny Davis and, and Danny Thompson, Thompson yeah. I mean, is is because these guys have had staying power. You know what I mean? Uh, for whatever reason, they've they've come to the to the group and they've they've stayed. You know, and they've. Uh, well, that brings us full circle, and maybe we'll go to some music because that's the parallel to Ellington: the staying power, the personnel, the names, the same. You know, it's getting up in those. Yeah, years. I mean, yeah, there, yeah, there are same. read names that go over thirty years back in the orchestra's history. Well, you know, the guys, the guys believe in in what they're doing. You know, they believe in music. They're dedicated to it, and uh, um, and frankly, there isn't anything else out there that uh, that probably challenge the guys the way they want to be challenged in doing what they're doing i mean uh it's not it, it's definitely a labor of love because these guys certainly aren't rich hmm. you know yeah well this is a labor of love uh made all the more uh full and beautiful through pat patrick's attendance on yet another sun rock gig the sun Ra festival we are talking with pat patrick live on the airwaves of the Sun Ra Spaceways, WKCRFM, New York. I'm Phil Schaap. I'm going to have, what we're going to do now, if it's okay with Pat Patrick, is I'll have you introduce the music that you brought, which is a recent performance, very recent, in fact. And uh, then uh, maybe we'll try a, a crack at chronological. We'll, after we hear Now's music, we'll go back to yesteryear and bring it forward. Would you? This is a, a concert, a recent yes, concert? Yes, this was a concert we did back in... June of um, on or the early first part of July in uh, East Berlin. Um, we were over there doing a tour, and our final engagement was this particular one. And uh, it was in a large hall that was used for video studio also. So they videotaped the the gig and recorded it also, and so. Uh, from the tapes that they made, uh, uh, you know, Sun Ra produced this uh, this segment of the concert. It's just part of it, you know, uh -huh. and uh, put it on cassettes. And they usually have some when we play here and there. And so I brought one along just in case you didn't have one up here <laughs> to kind of help fill out your, uh, your um, music volumes, you know. Okay, a rarity I brought over from behind the Iron Curtain, which shows you the spaceways have been traveled. Right. And this is Sun Ra in uh, early summer 1986 in a uh, recording brought to us by our guests on the Sun Ra Festival, Pat Patrick. You're okay, we're for... back here with Pat Patrick in uh, master control of uh, the fabulous home of technical difficulties, radio station WKCR FM, New York, 89.9 on the dial. Phil Schaap here with you. The Sun Ra Festival is now eight hours old, 100 and uh, eight hours to go, and we'll be going till Tuesday morning, the 21st. Uh, so please get the word out here, especially going into a holiday weekend. Probably uh, you'll be seeing some people, maybe if you're working tomorrow, if you're the day off, you'll be seeing other people. Get the word out, because we have no advertising budget outside of uh, people like Charles Glass and Andy Rothman, Maurice Coleman, hanging up posters all over New York. Uh, but there weren't enough poster hangers on Saturn. So uh, get the message out, as it's Sun Ra on the air uh, around the clock first of all uh pat patrick uh any comments on the on the work that we just had on the air that you brought to us on cassette well music speaks for itself i guess you got to hear it in total to get the full picture 
which it is only a partial picture of that per night's performance, but it it was quite an enthusiastic crowd there, and the place was packed, and they seemed to enjoy music as we, you know, very much. And and you know, since then, since that time, back in November, we went over again. Only this time, we went to, I think, as a result of this performance, because it was tele cast probably through a lot of the the Iron Curtain countries um, we played in Leipzig which is East Berlin and also from there we went to a town called Kaliz in Poland and uh, reception was good over there too you know we're talking with Pat Patrick on the Sun Rock Festival a live interview as part of the proceedings we began the the interview with a compliment to Mr. Patrick of predicting this event, this Sun Ra Festival, during a Duke Ellington Festival many, many years ago on these same station airwaves. Uh, you uh, didn't really dabble that much into the compositional concepts of Sun Ra, and, but we were talking while uh, we were just about ready to go on mic. In fact, we were still talking mm -hmm. as we go back on mic. Uh, there was uh, a, literally a, a compositional message that you wanted to bring from Sonny. Yeah, he said uh, to let you know that uh, he has uh, the first of a uh, nine-volume set of music that he calls the Manhattan Undertone Symphony, that uh, if you were interested in hearing it on, during the program, would be, the, be a first, I'm sure, because it hasn't been heard before. Uh, he might, you know, make an effort to see that you got it up here so you could play it during the festival. Did you perform on that? Well, no, nah, I'm not really sure. <laughs> 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 uh, see, I we'll have to we'll have to wait and see on that. Well, you know, we were talking about musical notation uh, with. Uh, Sun Ra's music and the fact that the scores, as far as musical notation, is rather straightforward uh, and does its best to illustrate the music it represents, so that anyone can sit down and join the bandstand. How about titles? Well, do you it's know not, what? Do you know what you're playing? Yeah, it's not always that anyone can do it. I mean, you know, it. I dare say it takes a it takes a minute for somebody to come in, sit on, and band. <laughs> you know, just. I mean, you know. When they're when they're open and playing freer, you know it's possible. But to get into the music, it takes a minute. You know, mm -hmm. you know, get on with those charts and everything. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. I, I'm glad to get that input. Uh, but I mean, you wouldn't. You said you don't know whether you're playing this. Uh, and I've got to get the title correct again too. This Manhattan Undertone, Undertone Symphony, Symphony yeah. in nine volumes, yeah. which means nine albums probably. Or well now cassettes or now it might mean nine, all I, nine all books. I'm knowing him all I'm going to relate to you is what <laughs> he told me and so <laughs> to get into further detail uh, you'll have to well how frequently would you know the name of the work you would be performing from the music in front of you on the bandstand with Sun Ra how frequently yeah how frequently is it annotated that oh we're playing this piece how does it, how is a piece indicated what is the uh, the bandstand mechanism. Oh yeah, that, there are titles. There are titles for, you know, there, sketches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there things like band numbers too? Like with Duke, I think one hundred seven, one hundred eight. That means uh, we're gonna play diminuendo and crescendo and blue. Oh yeah, his own personal compositions have some titles that are really, really uh, a scream. You know, mm -hmm. he has some very interesting, intriguing titles to a lot of his stuff. You know, um, like uh, Interstellar Lowways and. You know, just to name some of the older, more familiar ones, Rocket Number Nine and and Discipline Twenty Seven and Twenty Eight and Thirty Eight and so on. Uh, you know that sort of stuff. Various periods he's going through, he may just label them. Sometimes it's just a date, you know, put a date on it, you know, or a town, <laughs> mm -hmm. or. Uh, like uh, I remember, he has written a long time ago, "Song of Pleiades." I was watching a TV program the other day on the UFOs, and uh, in, the, in there they said that uh, one of the people that had been taken on this ship and examined by these creatures in the UFOs, 
had told them that they were from Pleiades. Uh huh. Thought that was interesting. <laughs> I bet you. This did. particular song he wrote back in Chicago. In the fifties. Yes. And the television you saw? Yes, the other day. Sunra Radio, WKCR <laughs> FM, New York. When you said back in Chicago, that leads us to the direction I'd like us to head now in this interview with Pat Patrick. We have uh, a memory, but it's your memory, and we'd like to open it up and share it with the listeners who, who are aware of a concept. They know that there is a a person, a thing, a being, an orchestra that expands from it that is a very unique uh, individual of a musical genius and a way of putting it forward with a band. And they know that the band has been around for a while, has been traveling the spaceways. And one of the first stops on this planet was the formulation of the orchestra in the early and middle 50s in Chicago. And uh, Pat Patrick was there at the get-go. Could you uh, develop the story for us? Well, at the time I was still in school, uh, I think I'd, uh, well, I met some, uh, on, on some gigs around town, you know, we'd wind up on some of the same gigs and I always noticed that his playing was different, you know, so much so that one night, uh, we were playing on a job and, uh, all of a sudden, I heard another instrument, you know, it sounded like another instrument. So I turned around, stopped playing, turned around to see what was going on. And it was him playing the piano, but it 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 left the piano sound totally. I I mean, maybe you might say, well, I was young and impressionable at the time. I must have been 18. But uh, I never forget the effect. That, that, you know, the sound had on me, you know. And so from that point on, I knew this individual had something uh, special going on. So about the time I was in college, he started rehearsing a trio. And the trio was Sun Ra, myself on baritone, and uh, Robert Berry on drums. And along with that trio, he was also rehearsing a vocal group of fellas, about four fellas, and we would rehearse practically every day, uh, particularly the trio and the and the vocal group would come in, and they were singing, uh, I guess, what you would call kind of pop music of the day, but with his writing, it had a little different flair to it, of course, you know, and uh, that was that was how things seemed to get started for me with him. Uh, we were we were rehearsing practically every day in a little studio, upright piano, and uh, he was writing tunes every day. He'd have two or three different tunes, and uh, just the three of us. So and, would this studio have been his studio, or was this a rental? No, it was a little studio that somebody, a friend or somebody had on 63rd Street in Chicago. Near the Pershing? Uh, not far. It was uh, between there and uh, South Parkway, which was, say, I... Uh, Half mile walk, I suppose. Oh, I see. We're talking with Pat Patrick. Less. And we're talking about the earliest dawn, uh, a meeting with a sound and a musician, the growth to a trio, and the introduction to the regimen, which, remembering our first talk about Sun Ra, is still the most dominant thing that you and Ronnie Boykins brought to me in the early chats about Sun Ra many, mm -hmm. many years ago. Hard to believe, but yes, many, many years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, it was an overwhelming memory. Is it now 15 years have passed, Pat? Uh, is it still that dominant in your memory, it, it, you know, that the rehearsals would be long, that there would be more than one a day, and they would both be long, and that that, that, that was a constant that never was let up? Is that the way it was? Amazingly, the, he's still doing that, you know. He's... Uh has a place in Philadelphia and most of the guys over there and uh and they're rehearsing practically all the time because they're all right together, you know. So they they're constantly doing something when you know, whenever possible. So he has he has a pension for uh for rehearsing. I guess much like uh 
Duke had in, in his with his band because the band reflects his voice and his thoughts and ideas, you know. Is the purpose of the multiple rehearsals then and now, or if it's a different answer for each time, perfection and execution or for the opportunity for the creator to hear the music? That you got to address to him. <laughs> okay. Was there, a, was there a success in the repetition for you as a musician? Did you get better with the multiple? Uh... Oh, sure. You got to, you got to, uh, you got to, make some kind of progress because uh and development because the music is challenging you know and uh consistent playing and challenge like that helps you you know develop we're talking with pat patrick about the early years of sun Ra, the development of a trio plus vocal group was this vocal group now i know it's different because they're doing sun Ra's music but is this uh vocal group a uh uh, a Ravens Orioles kind of slant, or is it a Lambert Hendrix almost, Ross? Almost, almost. Uh -huh. Yeah. And when you say he wrote the music, he's writing choral parts. He's got these four voices. Is he writing lyrics? Yes. Mm. Yeah. I think he has some of that material too. You know, um, on record. Uh, whether or not he still has some of that trio stuff, he may have because he generally carried his uh, recorders around. You know. And tape what we were doing so he may have some of that too you know you never know was his recording of his own music there at the start to your memory oh yeah he had he, he had wire recorders when they were around <laughs> i think one of the first time i saw one was one he had or i i do remember having seen him at the persian ballroom when there's some people there were taping uh charlie parker's gigs and, Lester Young's gigs when uh -huh. they played there. I remember seeing them there, too. Hey, do you think he taped Charlie Parker at the Pershing? Who? Sun Ra. Maybe. No, I don't remember seeing him there. Uh -huh. may have been around. At, you oh, know, you're talking know. about seeing the recorders, yeah. The We're, recorders, right. Yeah. We're talking with Pat Patrick. Tell me about writing music for a trio. I mean, you know, w one of the things uh, right before the interview was a small group thing, and there was... There was a trio effect within the ensemble on all of those tunes, uh, St. Louis Blues in particular. What's new, of course, because you had your drum and keyboard backing for the two major soloists, Gilmore and Michael Ray. W what was trio music right? I mean, we're talking about the orchestra writer, Sun Ra, and he's writing for three pieces. What did he do? Well, um, I don't know. He, uh, you mean, what did he write? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, what was striking about it? I mean, now it's bar you're playing primarily baritone. Yeah, baritone saxophone, piano, and drums. And drums. Well, now their drum part. For let started. me, let me. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there were there were at the time. Let me just but there maybe was a give drum you. Part. Yeah, I'm sure there was. You know, we're talking about 37 years <laughs> ago. <laughs> I know. Uh, or thereabout. But let me give you an insight. Um, there's a guy on this album you just showed me here who at the time was in Chicago playing drums around there. Uh, then he played with him probably and worked with him before I did even. Uh, they used to work in a, in a, in some burlesque houses that you worked eight, 10, 12 hours in these places, you know, and that was the instrumentation. It was a horn, drums and piano. Now, whether or not there is a connection between that and 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 incidentally, I made some of those gigs myself. I mean, it was the type of gig where the music went on constantly because the the acts were going on constantly, and if somebody everybody got a fifteen minute or twenty minute break or so, but it was only one person at a time. So whoever left to take a break, the other two had to carry on. Uh, if it was the drummer, piano. And myself, I might play my horn, and then I may play some drums behind the piano. Uh, if the drummer, then vice versa. Or if now, when it got down to Sonny taking a break, then it was difficult because then it was just the horn and the drums to carry on until he got back, you know. So it, 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 made, it made you stronger in terms of being independent. You had to be steady you know girls are dancing on the music and stuff too but i mean now i would just brought that up just to maybe show that maybe there was some connection why there was a trio 
uh, to start with. I mean, why not a symphony orchestra to start with? Well, it could have <laughs> happened that way, but it just didn't. It started with a trio, you see. Of course, two other connections would be your economics is another reason for a trio. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you couldn't hardly get a symphony in that little room we were rehearsing. In. And uh, another thing is that uh, an interesting connection beyond the fact that three pieces played these burlesque houses, but that the idea of a review of supporting different acts presenting music for a continuous flow of show is a dawn of uh, the theatrical and full-scale presentations concepts, which... Uh, more recent listeners are completely attuned to and mm -hmm. following the Sun Ra mm -hmm. presentation. We're talking with Pat Patrick about the early days, so why don't you just pick it up from there? So you got the three pieces plus the, the vocal group, and you got Sun Ra doing writing, which includes the drum part and includes both lyrics as well as the mm -hmm. voicings for the chorus. Uh, where, where did well, it go that, from there? That went on for a while, then, uh, and then uh, he he started enlarging the band. Um, uh, I, um, who was the drummer, by the way, the original drummer, B Robert Berry. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. He's still around Chicago now. I understand still playing. Um, then, uh, I think it graduated to a quartet or so because, uh, there was a time when I was away and John Gilmore came in and they started working some jobs as a quartet. And then along that same time, I guess, uh, Julian Priester came along and uh, was a trombone, and uh, I think um, shortly thereafter, um, Richard Evans, you heard of him? Sure. He, he, he was did a bass. He did some writing himself. He did too. a lot of writing, yes. For did uh, He was in the studios quite a bit in Chicago, but he arranged a al big album for uh, Ahmed Jamal and yes. some others. Uh, he was on bass, and then uh, in around 56 or 5 or 6 or so, Marshall Allen came in and then started getting a little bigger, mm -hmm. and uh, Charles Davis, and I think Charles and Julian must have come pretty much around the same time, because they were um, buddies, you know, they mm -hmm. lived pretty close to each other, Right. and uh, then we started doing this... Um, Birdland, or it was called Budland then gig, you know. Budland, like Bud Land. not for Bud Powell or Bud Beer. Bud, <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> Budland. I think the reason that happened was that uh, at the time the club was going, uh, their Birdland was still happening here in New York, and uh, there arose a little uh, difficulty about the use of the same name, so uh, they settled on calling it Budland. And we were working there in a like a early Monday morning show that started around four in the morning. And on that job was uh, the band had gotten to about eight or nine people. There was myself, John Gilmore, Julian Priester, uh, Dave Young on trumpet, Robert Berry. Richard Evans on bass, Jim Herndon on timpani and Sun Ra. So that's about eight people, I guess. So uh, could you uh, could you explain to us? Uh, uh, well, first of all, let, let, let's make it an individual thing. You weren't there when John Gilmore came in, but you were because you were away for a moment. But do you recall uh, the arrival of uh, m uh, of Marshall Allen and uh, and? Uh, can you recall anything about it in particular? His joining the the forces. Mm, not. Not too much. It's just that uh, I can remember once we were rehearsing at a at a ballroom there, and uh, that's when I remember Marshall being being there because uh, at this particular time they film, they recorded and filmed some some music and some shots that were used behind a, a picture called uh, uh, The Cry of Jazz. You ever heard of that one? I've heard of this sequence, yes. Yeah, and uh, they used some scenes from that that hall, and we were playing in there, you know. So I remember, I think, Marshall being on that set, you know. It's, the way things happen over the, such a long period of time, it's hard to pinpoint some of the 
those things but i think that's the sequence is right you know it's who followed who in the in the group uh, second question uh you're uh, you're following the this man sun ra this musician uh you talked about what he did on the piano one night knocked you out what is your impression you were a real and remain an ardent student of this music you know a lot about the great music and why different greats are different uh what is how do how do you make heads or tails of sun how do you relate sun ra's music at that point in time to your jazz experience uh what, what were you thinking about the music you already had this attraction to staying with it even then this dedication that uh has been dominant for years what 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 grabbed you about his music? What was different about it? <laughs> uh, well, I guess he grabbed me, you know, because uh, um, you know when you're when you're coming along, uh, you you're trying to learn how to play an instrument, and uh, if someone is volunteering to show you some things and that that you feel is beneficial to your development you tend to uh, gravitate towards that so um when was the first time that the the compositions the things you were listening to as you played them struck you said wow or did that ever happen yeah um uh you know it's 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 a little difficult maybe to to get a full picture of things in uh, the smaller setting, perhaps, but I do remember back during those early days at Budland when we'd be down there rehearsing. Um, I just suddenly, all of a sudden, started listening to the overall sound, and we were rehearsing something one day that uh, sounded like children in a in a, in a in a playground playing, you know, swings and teeter totters and all that other stuff. It, I mean, it's you know, I, I I suddenly stopped playing. I had to listen, you know, because it sounded just like kids in a yard playing, you know. And I looked at the music and I, <laughs> I said, play my part. It's weird. And, you know, I don't know if we've ever played that particular tune since then. And that was just a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Do you think this music, uh, since there was so much of it and so little real clear documentation of its existence and and uh, and uh, just its existence on paper any longer, as well as on recording device. Do you think that uh, uh, that Sun Ra has most of that? That, that that it has been maintained. That somewhere there is maybe without a number, without a name, the music of children on playground swings. Oh yeah, it must be somewhere <laughs> in space, <laughs> if not here. But uh, uh, you know, he's the type that. He, he's a, you know he doesn't stand still long he's probably working on even at that time he'd be working on two or three different things at once anyway so tell me uh did the uh addition of extra instruments change his voicing and his writing do you do did and it obviously must have changed it somewhat from three pieces to nine and on mm -hmm. uh what, what what was different what what did he do with the extra pieces how did he employ them and by extension, did he employ them differently than you would have thought? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know, man. You, you know, it's... Uh, you know, and it's funny about music. You know, people hear things differently, too, so... I guess in the final analysis, everybody is their own final uh, appreciator of what they hear, you know, and the way they hear it, you know. Uh, I could paint a a verbal picture of this, that, and the other, but until you hear it, you can't really relate to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. How about people relating to Sun Ra's music? Uh, you mentioned uh, Bud Lamb, uh, parallel to the success in New York of Birdland. Uh, you, of course, also played the Pershing, uh, uh, which we spoke of a, a few moments ago. How was the music received, perceived, and uh, was it more, much more rehearsing <laughs> than gigs? Well, let me tell you something. Uh, it hasn't... It hasn't always been... Uh, 
peaches and cream, so to speak. As a matter of fact, to give you an example, just today I was in a barber shop and uh, music uh, came on the air and uh, there was one individual in there that uh, didn't particularly like what was happening, you know, and berated it, you know, and so that brought a little conflict of interest between the other person. As a matter of fact, it got so heated that I had to step in between for some blows almost came about, you know. So it has different effects on, you know, it had different effects on different people, I guess, you know. I mean, just like I was saying a minute ago, unless you're, like, maybe you've heard this statement, he who hath an ear, let him hear that's an old biblical quote or something. Uh, if you can hear it, you can hear it. If you can't, you can't. I mean, how how can you? There's no way you can make a person uh, hear something, you know, if they just haven't opened up to being able to digest it. There's nothing you can do for them, you know. And, and until such time as it dawns on them, you know, or, or something, you know, if it stays within their subconscious long enough to make an impression you know what are are, are you saying uh, in a roundabout way that there are a lot of people who couldn't lend an ear to listening to Sun Ra let me let me tell you something I could t I could tell you from now the rest of the night about the dues we had to pay th through lack of uh, interest or appreciation and it's still happening. In, in in you know in, in a lot of in some sense you know I mean certainly now he's with the hit the records and having traveled and stuff he has a greater audience than he ever has had and more people do appreciate him uh, it's a far cry from those beginnings you know and uh, and it, it, it's 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 even tougher when. You figure that uh, people of your own ilk, you know, would, would or should or might be more inclined to dig it, but for some reason or other, they're not. And perhaps uh, that's attributable to the fact that um, people having been conditioned from, you know, what they hear ordinarily or, or used to hearing or something in the... You know, it takes a while for them to grow into something different, you know, something new. It still remains new, and uh, that's interesting. And it's not just the most recent recordings. Uh, the earliest Saturns, the earliest releases uh, have a quality. Uh, one of his albums, uh, the one that Tom Wilson put together for Savoy in the early 60s, uh, can't quite get that name out of what it was called then but when they the futuristic sounds the futuristic sounds right but when it was reissued mm -hmm. the statement is we are in the future yeah uh to what extent is there is, is certainly he has the uh the ability uh i mean the opportunity he could rightfully pull an i told you so i mean uh there's this whole new you got to have this new kind of sound, this new world, this new representation of a of a con a world of conflict uh, in the music, and it represents it. And it seems that you can very well represent it with 1961 Sun Ra recordings. Uh, uh, does uh, well, obviously, this is another question where you're going to say, "I have to ask Sonny." How about you? Do you have a kind of like uh, since so many dues were paid, since it was not peaches and cream? But you were there firstest, and many of us in this room would say with the mostest, you know, to, uh, you know, have an I told you so kind of thing. Do you, do you feel that uh, the music should have been recognized earlier, or, or you're at peace with the fact that it took a long time for it even to get the recognition it receives here in 1987? That's hindsight, right? Well, you're all <laughs> blessed with it. <laughs> I mean, I, of course, it, I think... Uh, had things been another way, you could say that uh, maybe it could have been better or something like that. But uh, 
I'm not one to try to rewrite history. I mean, uh, what happened happened, and perhaps it's all happened for the better. I hope to think, I'd rather like to think so, you know. Right. Uh, the mere fact that we've survived it and we're here now, well, that's uh, that's uh, fine and dandy, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. Uh, that's, that's, you know, you can hardly, with decent health, you, you can hardly ask for more than that on a planet like this, you know. It's a lot of guys who are have come along and, and split and, uh, you know, for one reason or other, they're not here. So we just have to look at uh, the fact that we are here and try to figure out why that is <laughs> mm-hmm. and keep going, you know. Well, we're here with a charter member of the orchestra, this man, Pat Patrick, who is our guest here right now during our Sun Ra Festival. And this is a live interview, and these comments are more than off the cuff. They're quick, but they're heartfelt, and I hope that that's coming across because this is a gentleman who has graced our airwaves through the recordings and through his visits, and I'm speaking both of Pat Patrick and Sun Ra, uh, who have really added a kindness in presenting the opportunity to lend an ear and hear if you can. Sun Ra's music. Pat Patrick is here talking of uh, the early years, and he was one of the three when it all started. Uh, with drummer Barry, Sun Ra, of course, himself on keyboard, and Pat Patrick was playing baritone saxophone. I might like to, to hear that band someday if I might. Uh, certainly, uh, it is still part of uh, what we were just listening to. I don't... Uh, I don't- I'm Go sorry. Ahead. I don't think we ever performed in public with mm-hmm. that group. I'm not sure. If we did, it could have been very well backing up that trio. Mm-hmm. I mean, the quartet, quartet. of singers, yeah, uh-huh. on something. Uh, how about taking uh, the last question, the question uh, that uh, you referred to as hindsight. Some might say it could have been sour grapes. How about the other way around? In the 60s, right there in Chicago, right where it's happening, is a new wave of new music in jazz from people equally dedicated with a different music, but an equally dedicated paying the same kind of dues mm-hmm. and none of it being peaches and cream, going in a way that is parallel but quite different from it also the way Sun Ra assembled his ensemble and continued, which I'm, of course, speaking of the AACM. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did, and if you want to individualize it, what did you make of the coming of, of the of the clear-cut avant-garde of jazz in the mid-60s, which is still a dominant force in, in new sounds and jazz to this day? And what do you remember of uh, Sun Ra's uh, thinking of, of these new people who were arriving on the scene? Of course, Muhal was very much on the scene and was a known force on piano, but uh, of, the, of the whole AACM. Well, uh, unfortunately, I can't answer that too much in detail because uh, in the 60s, I, in, in 1960, I wasn't around. I had uh, left town with the be a part of James Moody's band and so I was traveling and uh, that I guess was a lot of the time that the AECM was starting uh, Sun Ra himself and the group went up left there around 61 or something went on a gig in Canada so um, much of that I can't speak on although I, I heard that they were doing good work and, and still are um but, uh, and, you know, like the art ensemble, and some of those fellows have come out of there, and some other guys that have come to New York since that time, and they're all seem to be fine musicians, you know. And and I would only say that I I guess they were kind of uh, take, taking on the, the uh, baton and then was carrying the man along, you know, after... The group had split, you know, and doing some things in a in a uh, contemporary, modern, futuristic type way, you know. Mm-hmm. When did uh, now? Of course, the instrumentation of the band, as well as the number of people in the ensemble, still varies almost from gig to gig, and there's never really been a fixed norm. But uh, one of the things that Sun Ra did that links him to other people who may not be relatable musically is that he tried to start a big band after the big band years are over or an orchestra, an orchestra. Mm-hmm. So, and now the sixties have come. And if I'm not mistaken, you were back in the fold regularly in the, the by the mid sixties, because you're on a mm-hmm. lot of performances that 64, 65, 66 period. I seem mm-hmm. to recall you being there a lot Yeah, with John Orr, right? 
John Orr was around. On yeah, Ronnie's things. gone for a while, and you're back. Am, am I right? I, I mean, I, I more or less. Wrong. Yeah. More or less. Um, so uh, you're there in the, the decade that jazz is taking on the chin. You know, you talked about Budland. Birdland closed in '65. Yeah. Sunrise keeping this band together at at, at a cost still being paid by the musicians as the leaders and stuff like that. Uh, um, when did, uh, did when did you realize that it was going to be an orchestral or orchestral sound, if you will, that it was never going back to that, to, except for part of the performance of the thing, that this was going to be a band different, but of the ilk of the Ellington and the and the large orchestras going on, representing a body of music. Well, he, um, you know, about that time you're speaking of. Uh... We start. I think what came first was uh, this particular record, the futuristic sounds that Savoy record that was made. I think in the area of sixty-two ish or three. Now, prior to that, the same Tom Wilson had produced a record that we recorded in Chicago that had quite a few musicians on it. That was for the old um, uh, label out of Boston. Um, Transition. Transition, right. Uh, do you happen to have that record? That's a rarity. The transition record. The sound of joy now. Uh no, it's an it had a it had a black kind of checkerboard cover on it. And they also produced a, a sampler that had Coltrane and Cecil Taylor playing during yes. that time. Um so so I think his tendency was leaning towards the larger stuff even back in Chicago. But uh, towards the middle part of uh, the 60s, we started playing in slugs, you know, on mm-hmm. Lower East Side. And that band it was growing it was growing in, you know. Guys were coming in. Danny Davis was coming in about that time. Danny Thompson, Jack uh, Jackson on the bassoon and, and his log drum and and uh, some of the other guys, of course, you mentioned uh, Farrell was around, came in briefly, briefly during the time that John went off with the and played with the uh, trout toured with uh, Art Blakey's group, you know. Yeah. So um, the personnel was gaining in, uh, in people at the time. And um, so I guess it was just a matter of. Uh, natural uh, inclination you know right yeah we're talking with pat patrick a live interview with a charter member of sunrise musical organizations you're hearing it live on the sunra festival this is wkcrfm new york 89.9 on the dial phil Schaff here with you and pat i, I know i'm grilling you and uh, sorry, uh, to a certain right. extent uh, you it's know good I, for the mind i'm prime but uh, uh the gigs if we could do an overview of the engagements uh the, you're playing music uh, in Chicago, in places that are linked really to the old presentation. You, they're, they're they're not quite theaters, but they're ballrooms, they're nightclubs, they're places where the music is a supportive element to an evening of fun. Uh, then, uh, you say uh, like in the early '60s, Sun Ra got an engagement in Canada. I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure what kind of gig that was, but in Slugs, as interesting a home for music as it was <laughs> in slugs uh you know the idea was sun Ra, special music come here and listen and uh there were other things too uh jazz gallery not the one that they had a few years ago but on uh eight saint mark's yeah, yeah 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 it wasn't the five spot it was sort of like you could go there on an afternoon and there'd be like a concert presentation then a lot of the mm. same players well, I, I, in any case, you get the gist of I'm, there's a transition from the 50s to the 60s to uh, striving to get the same kind of gigs the other bands are playing, whatever the other bands are playing, to starting to get gigs, affording an opportunity for what listenership Sun Ra had to hear Sun Ra. Did, is, that a, is that my perception as a historian, or is that really the way it was? You were there. Well, you know, uh, we started these... Uh... Well, we had played a few little places uh, prior to Slugs on the Lower East Side and here and there, but uh, um, and and uh, the Village Vanguard was one place too. At one time, we had 
early on we played down there and the formation of that um, writers guild uh, was done down in there you know this is uh, prior to slugs and all of that so the law scene was opening up and uh, some of that stuff but I think as a result of playing at slugs every Monday night it gave people a kind of a place where they could go uh, you know at any given Monday and and catch the band so it did uh, a lot I guess to help the band's reputation in the city get known you know and uh, from that one thing led into another you got see Sun Ra has been a type of person who's probably been associated with big bands and stuff much longer than any the rest of us because even before Chicago he had a collegiate band of of, of his peers that uh, he was a leader of and uh, prior to coming in Chicago and then during Chicago having worked with uh, not only Fletcher Henderson but um, having arranged and orchestrated and, and rehearsed the orchestra for the Club de Lisa, which was a pretty sizable band of about 15 or so. Right. Uh, so he's kind of custom to big stuff, you know. Sun Ra had a band at the Savoy in Chicago in 34. His own. The one he brought up from Birmingham, Alabama. Hmm. Uh, we're talking with Pat Patrick about uh, his early years with Sun Ra. Did Sun Ra speak with you about his early years in jazz? Did he talk about You mean when we were getting together? Or at any time not, over the last 30 not, years? Not that much, you know. He, early on, he was busy doing his thing, so... Uh, when did you find out he had played for Fletcher Henderson? Uh, well, it was later on, you know, because during the time that was happening, I guess I was somewhere else. Or maybe I had... See, I only started playing the saxophone in Oh, you were 46. very young. Six. Yeah, well, you were very young when 16. he played. With, yeah, well, you were 16 when he played with Fletcher Henderson. Yeah, well, at that time, I hadn't even got in, gotten into the center of Chicago then. Mm -hmm. I was kind of on the outskirts of town. And I only came into and started going to mm -hmm. DuSable in 47. Right. Tell me, does, uh, does Sun Ra know you played with Horace Henderson? That was that was later. I, I know when when it that was. was later. I, yeah, but I said, does he know you play with Horace Henderson? Oh you know yeah, he, <laughs> he was around then. Yeah, he was around. As a matter of fact, I was playing with him at during the same time. You sure. know, because the 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 Horace Henderson gig was what you'd call a bread gig. You know, and mm -hmm. he had three nights that were in town at the old Trianon, Trianon. Ballroom. Incidentally, there's a the record out on sure. that. You have it, I believe. Yeah. I heard it on the radio one yes, day. Yes, I played it, and you called in the first Yeah, right. Uh, it's a shame they keep leaving Gus Chappelle out of these uh, things. I saw, I saw a book that the old uh, Billy Eckstein band, and they didn't list his name, uh, you know, band members. Mm -hmm. But he was a prominent part of that band. It certainly was prominent part of Sun Ra's organizations of music has been uh, Pat Patrick. Pat, uh, can we? Uh, I, I, these are now fairly standard questions, but equally difficult. Uh, of the music that you've played over the years, what stands out, or perhaps even is foremost in your mind, of what Sun Ra's done? Or perhaps if you don't want to isolate it in terms of pieces, what did it, what did it do that you think makes it so great? Is there, is there a work or two well, you'd like to play? Well, I, 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 a particular thing. Well, I can't really say there's a, any particular tune off the top of my head, but the mere fact that here is here is someone who is definitely um different you know he's uh he's uh he's beyond category in in a lot of ways uh his his dedication and fortitude and uh self discipline is is phenomenal um I think it would I, I just feel very fortunate to have have been uh, able to be around them as tough as as, as it's been you know I mean uh, uh, it it's it's been an education that I wouldn't have want to miss you know because he is 
he's opened my eyes and ears to a lot of things that I probably would have slept through ordinarily, you know. Could you give us an example? I mean, things outside of music. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. Uh, what are some things that what is Sun Ra about well, outside like, music, and what has he added like to your life? He, he is he's uh, he's given me a knowledge and uh, understanding of my roots and who I am and what you know uh, conditions in the world and the meaning of certain things and and uh, from a spiritual point of view and. Uh, philosophical point of view and, and and it's 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 been able to kind of give you a stability to withstand the madness of all of this because i'm sure um um a person like myself sees uh, the world differently than say some other people might see it you know because of the conditions because of the opportunities because of the the prejudices because of the fears and doubts and uh, discriminations and everything. You see, you're entirely in, inclined to get an entirely different view of what's happening, you know. I mean, it may look also nice and sweet and lovely to one person. It may be an, a total disaster and, uh, you know, to somebody else, you know, depending on your circumstances or or your appreciation of what's happening, you know, and uh, uh, it's so it's so confusing at times unless you have certain keys of wisdom. Uh, it could, you know, it can run you nuts. You see people out in the street all the time talking to themselves. There's a reason for that. They're not all nuts, you know, so to speak. Uh, it's just that perhaps they've gotten to a point where that's the way they react to the only way they know how, you know. Right. We're talking with Pat Patrick on the subject of Sun Ra's input into his knowledge of the way people are and the way things work and don't work at times. So. Uh, I'd like to, if uh, if I might switch off that topic, and your message was very much heard and felt, but musical moments. Um, all the time, Pat Patrick, who we're interviewing here on this Sun Ra Festival, you, you come up and you say, I remember the time that Bird was at the Beehive, and I remember this, and you can remember a gig and a performance, and you can call tune names and stuff like that. Now, we're talking 37 years of musical association with Sun Ra. Uh, are there musical moments, a performance, a night when we were playing that stand out in your mind that you might or possibly could relate to our to our audience and to me? I'm interested too, as you know. I mean, and why it was special is it because of the blend of the his orchestrating the whole evening on the stage, or because the guys were playing better, or something, some standout performances that you can recall, whatever you can recall about them. <laughs> Well, yeah, there's been quite a few of those. Uh, I don't know. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking about a a, a concert we were supposed to, we did play in um, in Paris, France, at the old Le Halls or something. It was a big marketplace or something in France at the time and uh, they had overbooked the place and uh, as we were about to start uh, the crowds outside were clamoring that they wanted to get in they got their tickets and they want to get in and the gendarmes are saying no more the place can't hold anymore and it was getting ready to be kind of an ugly scene <laughs> and uh, Sonny decided to march out around outside the place and around the place and try to uh, bring some stability to the situation so as we as he he just took off and everybody else fell in behind him 
And I uh, remember we were coming down the side of this place and then there was this John Darns here all standing with their muskets and stuff <laughs> and down the way. I said, oh, this looks like some kind of confrontation confront- coming up or something. Sonny just kept marching with the symbols and stuff. By the time we got up to them, they just opened up like the Red Sea and we watched, walked on past them and around in front of the place. And by that time, uh, I guess everybody decided, well, it was cool to let everybody go on in that could get in. And so... Because I think the fear was that the too many people in the place, it was an old building, may not be safe, you know, uh, might be a hazard or something. And uh, But they let, them, let it go ahead, and the concert went on, and during the, one of the height of the concerts, I, during the height of the concert, I remember walking out over a row of seats on the, on the backs of the seats with my baritone playing. I just started walking. And uh, I found myself four or five rows back, <laughs> not knowing. I don't. I still don't remember how I got back. Whether I stepped down because it was packed in there, you know. <laughs> whether I stepped down and came through the aisle or what. But uh, you know, you do some weird things during the height of a performance. <laughs> and uh, we were. I was even up in one of the air ducts there. At one point, so you know everybody spreads out, and it was a pretty wild night that night. <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think uh, it, by the way, it is nine o'clock, and we're nine hours into our hundred and sixteen hours of uh, Sun Ra radio activity on WKCR FM, New York, eighty nine point nine on the dial. My name is Phil Schaap, and uh, I've had the pleasure of listening to Sun Ra's music in a small group context on some records, and then our evening was highlighted by the visit of the man who can tell us of the ultimate Sun Ra small group, the trio that started over three and a half decades ago and has grown into spaceways of sounds and love and understanding. And, and there's really one last question I'd like to ask. It's one that it might be easy for you to answer, even though it's a hard question, because you could just say, well, we do it, and it's great. But in the early years... And you said this in the interview. And I'm glad that there are only a couple of things we touched on that we touched on uh, 15 years ago. So uh, if you heard that one then, this is different. But here's something that uh, was asked towards the end of those interviews in the early 70s here in this same station, which has probably changed uh, a bit too. And uh, but, But the question was, in the early 50s, you were younger, first of all. Two, he was older, he was worldly, otherworldly perhaps. He was able to shore up your musical constitution through his knowledge and genius. And again, as I said, you were young. So there's a reason to stick to it. There's a reason to rehearse on a ratio that you once figured out was about 180 hours rehearsal for our gig. <laughs> you throwing that at me one night. <laughs> but okay, now... Another 15 years go by in the 70s, you're still there. You, you're doing many other things, but you're still there, and, 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 and we're encouraged by that. I remember the baritone written you. Uh, you got a lot of encouragement to do your thing, your orchestra, your music, but you were still there. Another 15 years have gone by. What is, and I know it's an easy question to answer, and it's also the hardest one to answer. I mean, what is the power and why? the dedication of really the, the the central years of your life and still ongoing. Mm-hmm. Your career will be forever intertwined with the fact that for all the Ellington and Monk gigs and tours with James Moody, you're the charter member. You're the Harry Carney of the Sun Ra Orchestra. And w- why did you do it? <laughs> well... Probably because of Sun Ra himself, because uh, he is uh, another kind of being, you know. And uh, uh, being around him is is educational, and it's uh, does a lot for a person, you know. It does a lot for me. It helps you to understand, helps you to grow, helps you to develop. And, uh, 
you know, he's, I don't see anyone. I mean, you know, he's, he's been doing what he's doing. Other black so-called organizations have come along and tried to do this and that and the other and have failed in one way or another. And he's still operating, even though on a shoestring, he's still going ahead and, and, and it doesn't, nothing has seemed to, to sway his direction and his, his intent of what he's going to do and wants to do and he goes about it and does his business he doesn't uh, he's not out uh, getting in anybody's way or nothing he goes on minds his business and does his thing and uh, a person like that is to be admired and uh, they, we don't have any uh, we don't have many um, people like that to uh, to look up to and to gain inspiration from and knowledge and wisdom so he, you know, that alone is uh, reason enough to uh, try to be the best little follower you can, and you know, be somewhere around to absorb some of the the uh, things that he has to offer. You know, I think also that uh, you know, if uh, the world had uh, maybe in some way. Uh, made it possible for him to um, do his thing, to uh, have a place and have the means to create and produce uh, that which would, which, you know, would have the planet itself would have benefited from, you know. Uh, I think uh, all he's ever really uh, been concerned with is trying to uh, see uh, about what he could do to make this a better place to live. Well, thank you very much. Pat Patrick in our Sun Ra Festival interview number one. There's a friend, uh, he played with him. He's on the other side of that glass there, Mr. Davis. Oh, here. yeah, Charlie's here. And on the turntables, the record. I don't know if you remember this particular Saturn thing, but you played it for us. You brought it to the station many years ago. This isn't the same copy, of course, uh, but we've learned some lessons, too, from Pat Patrick. And so we've gone on, and we're still at it, maybe not 37 years later, but 15 years, <laughs> 17 years later. And that's a feather in your cap, too. It's uh. I have always appreciated the work that uh, you particularly and, and WKCR has done up here in terms of uh, keeping the music alive and out there on the air and uh, and presented in, in, in its purest forms, as, you know, and, uh, and that's, uh, you know, it's like an oasis here in the uh, heart of this town, you know, when uh, so many other things are happening that uh, don't don't swing as much simply as that you know in terms of you know you know what i mean i mean everybody's got their ways and forms of swinging who's to say which is the best but uh um only time i guess will uh well when it was first translated uh they said that the the way that uh, the world might swing along would be a highway of the future, and we'll change that to a spaceway of the future. Maybe <laughs> yeah. we've never done it better than 116 hours of Sun Ra. Thank you very much, Pat Patrick. Thank you. Oh, uh, one thing I should say, you know, like I just realized this isn't television. I flashed a record that the art forms of Dimensions Tomorrow on Saturn, the 1965 release. Now, this is an album that... Uh, that uh, Pat Patrick brought to our attention many, many years ago and played it here for us at the station. And I just pointed it at him and I expected everyone to know <laughs> what it is. So we're going to Saturn LP number 9956 for Solar Fidelity. <laughs> 